Welcome to the Analytics at Wharton and AI at Wharton podcast series on artificial intelligence. My name is Eric Bradlow, a professor of marketing and statistics here at the Wharton School. I'm also the vice dean of analytics. What we're doing in this series is to explore the role of artificial intelligence in various aspects of business. And today certainly is no exception. Maybe one that most people consider the most exciting, which is artificial intelligence in innovation management. I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Uh, first is Valeria Yakubovic. Uh, Valeria is executive director of the Mac Institute for Innovation Management. Uh, the Mac Institute focuses on creating synergies between research, teaching, and the practice of innovation management within the school. So, Valeria, welcome to our podcast. Uh, thank you. Glad to be here. I'm also joined by my friend and colleague, Christian Turvish. Uh, Christian is the Andrew M. Heller Professor at the Wharton School. He's a professor and chair of the Wharton Operations, Information, and Decisions Department here. He's also co-director of the Mac Institute, and he also holds a faculty appointment in the Perlman School of Medicine. Christian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. It's great to have you both. So let's first start. I hate it when people use jargon. So, Valeri, maybe I'll start with you. What is innovation management? And what does the Mac Institute do? And then we'll dive into what role AI may have to play in that. Uh, let me try also. I actually can rely on Christian's favorite definition of innovation I learned from my faculty co-directors. So basically, it's about matching uh, customer needs with uh, technological solutions we have out there. And what we do, basically, with uh, our priority, our departure, uh, kind of departure point is uh, faculty research. We fund it in innovation entrepreneurship, and then we try to translate it into um, experiential learning for students and business practice. For that purpose, we have a course with students, project-based. We have corporate partners with whom we work, kind of trying to identify their problems and provide some kind of guidance, thought leadership. And so over the years, we identified basically four areas which are the critical for us. Okay, It's uh, about... Um, uh, opportunities and risks, uh, how we discover them and mm -hmm. analyze them, strategy development, uh, organizing for innovation, what kind of organizational structures, teams, and so on you uh, set up and uh, employ, and finally, uh, value capture from innovation. And so in my view, today's conversation is about kind of how different types of AI, in particular generative AI, uh, affect all these areas. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's why I think I'm here. Yeah, so Christian, maybe you could tell our listeners here on the, this Sirius XM Wharton podcast series, I, I'm going to use the vernacular here. All hell must be breaking loose at the Mac Institute. I mean, if you guys are focusing on innovation, and I think most people would argue one of the big areas of application of these large language models like BARD and ChatGPT is innovation, like, how do you get started? Like, how do you as a scholar think about your research? How do you think about as a, a center director? How do you think about as the chair of the department? With all the hats you wear, where do you even get started? And how do you think about it? I will narrow it down to, to three dimensions of innovation that when I teach executive education, when I teach our MBA students, I would want to focus on. Right? There's the initial idea, and there is this combination of solution and need uh, that hopefully creates some form of value. That is something that a student needs to be able to manage from, I have an idea, towards launching a venture. And I think Ward has been wonderful at doing that. AI is helpful at that level because a lot of the things that used to be very expensive, very difficult to do, such as market research, such as prototyping, through so generative AI got a lot better. The second thing that we want to talk is about is in, in bigger organizations, established organizations, there's a pipeline of ideas flowing. Uh, they don't have just one idea, they have thousands of ideas. And that's a process that needs to be managed. And AI has been, as we showed in some of our research, been really good at, at fueling that process of filling that pipeline of ideas. And then the third thing is that process needs to have a direction. I mean, uh, most organizations, unlike their, unless they're venture capital firms, they have some form of strategic intent. And I have to help managers kind of think about possible future states of the world, possible disruptive threats. And again, ChatGPT or other kind of generative uh, models can help me imagine a world for which I would should be prepared that I myself would have not imagined. So let me ask you, Valeria, as well, um, whether it's in general or the two specific uses that Christian mentioned, which sit in my area of the world too, which is marketing research and prototyping. Um, 
would for our firms, as you're talking to them, would they really replace direct marketing research or creating minimal viable products and doing prototyping? Would they really trust artificial intelligence with this crucial step of the, let's call it, new product development process? Or what are you seeing out there? Well, actually, uh, they definitely don't uh, transfer decision-making to these uh, large language models. But what we do see, they bring them in and are trying to kind of um, take all the corpus of knowledge they accumulated over years, uh, bring it into kind of in interactions with these models and try to automate some parts of the process. And actually, we are doing the same here. We The consistent uh, request we have, for example, from the medical school or engineering school, when we work with them on their inventions and trying to kind of uh, develop PANS innovation ecosystem, uh, they ask us for market research. And the demand is so uh, substantial, we can't meet it with our uh, available tools and uh, available resources. So what we are doing now, we are trying to actually uh, figure out how to use large language models in assessing, let's say, potential uh, commercialization potential of inv new in inventions in uh, the School of Engineering. So could maybe, Christian, since I know you're both, you've written a number of books, you've written stuff on innovation and innovation tournaments, you've been an entrepreneur. How, can you take our listeners kind of this step-by-step -step process? Imagine the Mac Institute wanted to partner with Pennovation to try to help think about the economic value or how to best launch projects. How would you use artificial intelligence to help support that process? I think in any innovation process, there are two key functions. That is the generation of opportunities, create more, better, and higher variance opportunities. It's a very Darwinian process, so we need to create variety first. So let me start with that one. Large, lot of argument against generative AI is that it tends to work for the, you know, the, the, the center mass of the distribution. It doesn't give you very good ideas in the long tail. It doesn't, if it's not in that trained corpus, you won't see it in some. So how do you think it does in that first phase? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you asked. So we have done a study based on MBA generated ideas of which we have thousands in our database of uh, after teaching innovation for many years. And we compare this with large language models and to our surprise, the large language models are actually better of creating what we call high variance innovations, of polarizing innovations, of innovations where the payoff distribution has a high variance, which is good because innovations ideas have this real option flavor that if the idea is bad, we just cancel it. We don't execute just on it. Just for our listeners, as measured by whom? How do you measure the variance? Like, do you use humans or do you ask AI engine to score them then, on that? That would be uh, magic. Uh, so we get, we get to your second part in yeah. a moment when I get to my second part, yeah. which is a selection step. Uh, so how do we evaluate the quality of the ideas? Uh, we do purchase intent studies huh. uh, that uh, standard market research where we go on MTurk, uh, Prolific, or other platforms. We uh, showcase textual descriptions of the ideas. We ask for purchase intent probabilities uh, of large crowds, which is not perfect, but again, best practice of what you guys in marketing do. Very so before you get to the selection piece, let me ask you, let's imagine there's a world where people are doing what you're doing, and thousands of these types of, let's call it generative studies are done, and MTurk, and all of that's done, won't eventually an AI engine be able to forecast the stuff that we're using humans for to evaluate right now? Like right now, we just have a data problem. But if we had the data, AI could do that too. It's a really interesting question, right? I mean, what we've seen with humans over many, many years is the selection decision is always the hard one. Right. right? Okay. I mean, coming up with ideas is, I don't want to say easy, but it's, it's something that humans can do and now AI can do. When we try to use AI to predict the quality of an idea, it still struggles. And again, it's not too surprising in the sense that humans, even venture capitalists, are really having a hard time predicting the odds. Hmm. Valeria, any thoughts about that, about the, I'll call it the idea generation? By the way, I love this bifurcation into the idea generation stage versus the selection phase. And I, as a statistician, 
I would imagine with enough data eventually and enough variation, you know, as we always say, you need variation in X to be able to have good selection models. And you need to, of course, observe outcomes over time. I would imagine that if we're sitting here five years from now, AI engines may be able to do better, a lot better on the selection phase than they do now. But what are your thoughts? Well, actually, I think if you look a couple of years back, we thought AI will never be creative. We always thought AI will be predictive but creativity based on existing data and so on. And suddenly we're surprised. We find that generative AI is ex quite creative. And But if you think more about it, it's not so surprising. One, uh, how do we define creativity? We go back to Schumpeter, famous economist. Uh, he said it's about recombination of existing ideas. And because um, these large language models are trained on such a huge volume of information, which encompasses all kinds of diverse opinions, if the task is not very well defined, it actually d does better because it can produce all kinds of opinions you can imagine, all kinds of customer profiles you can imagine. And uh, this variability becomes very helpful for recombination, right? That's why these findings are quite uh, consistent with what we know where, how creativity operates. And, and by the way, the nice thing that uh, Krishna is doing, he's sharing a lot of his findings with the press and social media. So I had read that article and I'm glad that I read it. You, no, I, I give myself a good grade because that is what I read from the article. So I'm glad that I interpreted yeah. the findings appropriately. Um, so there's the technology piece. There's the innovation piece. But what about the company adoption piece? So what are you guys seeing in the Mac Institute part of the world? Are companies embracing this as the next great opportunity? Or as, or as companies thinking, my God, this is a threat to my business model? What do you see um, happening out there in the world? Uh, so we had just on Wednesday evening a session in executive education with the uh, custom analytics program that you're well familiar with, of course. Which I taught on on Monday. All right. And so we were talking about with the participants of what does it means for their business. And I think many of them are struggling, making sense of the technology. They know it's big, but they have a hard time for like, what do I do next? Where do I get started? And I think, I hate to say this to a marketing professor, right? But I mean, you start with your customer journey. You start with your customer pain points. It's not the right strategy to say like, Let's AI everything. You look for the customer journey. What are the customer needs? Where are the pain points? And then identify those and think along those customer journeys, where could AI be the right solution? You now have a new set of tools and you can go through your existing pain points that you might have known for many years and fix those. Plus you can find through the sensing technology of AI by having it read customer reviews, by interviewing it, you can find new pain points along the way that you might have not been aware of. I see. So, Valeri, um, what are you seeing since, uh, you know, as the executive director of the Mac Institute, a lot of your role is to interface with companies. You know, us as faculty directors, we obviously do a lot of research. We also interface with companies, but you're really on the front lines. What are you seeing today, and how are companies thinking that the Mac Institute can help them? Well, uh I think uh, right now, that's the major disruptive technology that preoccupies managers' attention. Basically, uh, I mentioned briefly that we have this experiential learning piece mm -hmm. uh, at the Mac Institute. We do projects with companies. This semester, out of seven projects, four are about generative AI. And I kind of looked at them before can you coming tell us, here. Can you tell our listeners, without giving necessarily the company or something, can you tell us what are those projects? Yeah, yeah, what are they on? Yeah, I can you a few kind of, uh, the, pretty much their names, their titles. Smart supply chain management using generative AI. Uh, AI synergy, strategizing op and operationalizing intelligent transformation. It's a very general kind of topic. One is directly relevant to in, uh, AI and innovation management. It's intelligent software testing with a AI ML innovations, right? So software testing is one major part of any yeah. innovation or testing prototyping uh, in general. And finally, evaluating the potential for disrupting the mortgage title industry through AI technology. <laughs> what I also see, I was last week in Silicon Valley meeting with our corporate partners, meeting with startups. Some of them gaining a lot of traction. For example, going back to innovation management, there is one company that um, pretty much automated the process of patent writing which is uh, extremely labor I saw intensive. an academic talk on that maybe about two or three months ago where I, I, I thought it was remarkable. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can think uh, it's very well-structured language, right, and very specific, very hard-to-understand language if you read the patent. 
Uh, but I can imagine it's pretty straightforward to train uh, machine learning uh, AI, generative AI, large language model to do it. And uh, what I noticed when companies deal with these things, what they need to do, they they obviously take an existing uh, large language model, foundation large language models, they don't develop their own, but then they need uh, safeguards, uh, a wall between the vendor of the model and their own knowledge base. And vendors now are willing to provide it. At the same time, also a number of startups emerged that actually uh, offering these companies um, security, privacy, and other tools to also not only safeguard their own knowledge base, but the knowledge base of their clients that they're going to use in order to de deliver value to clients. So I think this privacy, uh, confidentiality are key issues and security of these models, what we see going on. And uh, another example of very interesting creative application for innovation management, I encountered, it's a company that have a huge database base of cancer patients. Okay. And uh, now they are trying to engage large language models to match it with uh, FDA's uh, uh, database of clinical trials that are going on in order to find the right subjects for the right trials. Hmm. So it's, apparently it's a huge value added that can be done now at, at large scale using this model. So Christian, let me ask you on the, you know, I'll call it biggest opportunity side and the biggest area where you don't, you still don't see AI being used much. What are you seeing as like, if you had to give a lecture tomorrow to your MBA students and say, this is the most sophisticated, interesting, value added application of AI. This is what I've seen in the last three years. And if you also had to give the same lecture and say, and here's an example where I think there's an opportunity, but I haven't seen anything yet. What would those be? So in terms of what works, I think anything that is simple text writing and simple all the way to a new pattern, but that is a writing task, AI is amazing, and that I think that nut has been cracked. It's only going to get better. I think as faculty, we all get these inquiries. Professor Bradlow, could you summarize this paper for me? I mean, don't do this, right? AI can do this. And so I just, let me ask you, um, Part of both of our jobs is as journal editors and reviewers. Yeah. Should I ask, should I, no, the, the journals have a policy against this potentially right now, maybe not in the future, but let's say there was no policy. Should I take an article, jam it into an AI engine, ask it to give me a summary of it in addition to my reading of it? As a reviewer, you should not, but as somebody who wants uh, to stay current with the literature, having basically AI give you every morning uh, a two-minute summary of a paper that otherwise takes an hour or two hours to read, I think that would be a very healthy thing. Forget the ethical or moral parts of it. Why do you say as a reviewer I should not? I ha I could give a reason, but I'm not here. To, I'm here to interview you. Who cares what I think? What do you think? So as a reviewer, you have to make sure you have to turn over every stone to make sure that there's not a fault, a flaw in the paper, in the methodology. I think that is something which is a corner that I don't think AI is ready to do. I've tried this. AI is doing a decent job when you feed it a PDF of a paper saying like, look, there might be some issues with endogeneity or what have you, some pretty generic ones. I don't think it has the precision to dial in and say like, in equation seven, the error term is correlated with the explanatory variable. I see. Right? So I think there uh, we still have to do the homework. Um, the second type of work is uh, the one that puzzles me the most is analytical types of things, right? I mean, so uh, especially at the beginning when I gave GPT my MBA exam uh, a year ago. It yeah, was please tell our listeners about this because this, by the way, I, I, th I would guess it is probably the most publicized article that has come out of Wharton in the last five years. No, I'm just saying it was on every major news network. It was republished everywhere. So please tell people about the study, what you found, and then what you're still puzzled about. Uh, so over the winter break, my kids and I were sitting together. My kids are in college or through college. We were talking about GPT like everybody else probably in the world. And so the question came up like, Dad, you're teaching in this MBA course. You think that GPT could take your exam? And so we literally took my MBA exam and fed the questions, cut and pasted them in the prompt line, and it did really well. It did what I would have given it a solid B, if not a B plus. Over the subsequent months, uh, then with GPT-4 coming out, it is now well in the A range. Basically, the type of questions, and uh, my, my questions are mini cases, so to say, like 
10 lines of text with some computations in there, find the bottleneck, compute the inventory cost, uh, do some queuing analysis. Um, GPT is amazing at that, which again is counterintuitive because it's a language model, right? Yeah. It has, there's no representation inside of what capacity even is. Uh, you tell it to find a, a, a route through a uh, traveling salesman problem, connect uh, cities in the right sequence to minimize tra transportation time. It does a pretty decent job already, right out of the box. What is new since is uh, with GPT-4, also we have these plugins now. One of the set of plugins is from Wolfram Alpha, Alpha which uh, is kind of the, the, the power side for analytics. That's going to help. And that's going to help, right? But even the plain vanilla GPT out of the box has gotten pretty good at doing analytics tasks. So I imagine just as a layperson, most of our listeners here would have not used Wolfram Analytics unless they're nerds like you and me, right? I mean, that's an insider type of tool. Sure. You now have basically a user interface that lets you do sophisticated analytics that laypersons can do and in make inquiries into exploring, into analyzing hard mathematical problems, data sets, operations research type of problems. I think that is super exciting. Hmm. So, uh, Valeri, could you tell us about what role do students play at the Mac Institute? And um, what do you think, like when students, I'm sure, ask you all the time, they ask me all the time, especially when around machine learning, like, Professor Bradlow, what should I be studying now? What do you tell students? What should they focus on becoming great prompt engineers? Should they focus on being able to take the output of ChatGPT, integrate it with their own beliefs, and then help in decision making? How do you see that? Well, basically, uh, we have uh, they have a challenge now, uh, and Christian's research showed what the challenge is. You have to figure out ChatGPT can do better some tasks. You have to figure out where you belong. And there is actually another uh, recent study done by a large group of, group of researchers, among them uh, Ethan Mollick, our colleague uh, in management. Uh, uh, it was done at the Boston Consulting Group, where they really, in a randomized experiment, looked what consultants can do or can't do with uh, generative AI. And roughly speaking, my reading of the paper is that on exploration, their productivity drastically increases with uh, generative AI, large language models. On problem solving more specific contextual tasks which require more precision and uh, understanding of the context and so on, those who use uh, generative AI do worse. So basically we know, uh, Ethan, uh, actually Ethan and his colleagues talk about this kind of uh, changing frontier where which tasks can be done or cannot be done by generative AI, uh, and it's hard to identify, and it's a moving target, right? But they need to experiment themselves. They have to innovate and reinvent their careers in some sense. Uh, so disruptive uh, this technology is. Uh, yeah, so Christian, let me ask you, um, if we were sitting here five years from now, what do you think will have changed in those five years? Is it the language models will get better at prediction, which I'm sure the answer to that is yes. The application areas that we haven't even thought of will get done, that's probably yes. But what do you think are the big changes our listeners should know that is coming in the next five or so years? I think we have to stop thinking about the substitution game where will the MBA students be replaced by GPT? The amount of work that is going around in the world is not constant. If we make it efficient and cheap enough, there's new work that is going to bubble up. Right, so I just wrote as my latest paper, a paper on ethical advice and AI. Can AI give me ethical advice? And we show in the paper that it is basically as good as the ethicist in the New York Times on providing advice to, uh, to readers of people who face ethical dilemmas. So what does this mean? One hypothesis is it puts the ethics advisors out of business, but that's what, not, not what I think. What I think is going to happen is we're going to go to a, a virtual uh, zero marginal cost ethics advisor a lot more and get more ethical advice, right? And so this productivity gain is not putting people out of work. The amount of work that we can productively serve is going to grow up. And so the effect on employment is highly ambivalent. Hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, just to add to this, uh, I just worked on the paper with Peter Capelli and Sunny Tamber. Yeah. on kind of trying to think through these organizational implications of generative AI. And um, 
one point we are trying to make is the jobs consist of multiple tasks. And what we see so far, some tasks indeed can be automated, but then the amount of information you have to process produced by generative AI is at such a scale that sometimes uh, it becomes costly. You need to now make sense of this. And the problem is that these models really, uh, the kind of explainability is still a big problem. So uh, I talked to some engineers in this um, uh, area related to healthcare, and they're saying that new types of models now, they believe might replace large language models, which actually can, so to say, understand things at a large, uh, more conceptual level. When instead of predicting the next word, as these models do, you kind of, uh, based on what you know so far, you predict the next uh, kind of the, uh, high level concept and the text will follow from that concept. This is the way we think, right? And so apparently there is quite a bit of attraction in that area. Um, so we'll see, large language models, is it the last word, uh, or we'll have a totally or quite different technology, which is already out there for, for example, uh, visual images. Basically, when you see a part of the image, you reconstruct the second part completely instead of specific pixels, right? So there is a lot of development. Again, it's a moving target, which uh, is exciting to watch, these developments, and we need to adjust quickly and kind of explore these things as they appear. Well, this has been our episode on AI and innovation management. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Valery Yakubovich, the executive director of the Mac Institute, and my colleague, uh, Christian Turwish, the chair of the OID department here at the Wharton School, the co-director of the Mac Institute. Uh, thank you both for joining me on this Analytics at Wharton, AI at Wharton podcast series. Thank you very much for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us.